The information discussed on Pocket Money with Jeff Tarbell is believed to be from reliable sources. However, no responsibility is assumed for inaccuracies. No statement made on this broadcast should be construed as a specific recommendation of a particular investment product. Views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of CBS Radio. Views only as directed. Smiles, everyone. Smiles. And prepare yourself for... Show me the money! Ladies and gentlemen, the radio broadcast experience designed to keep your wallet in top condition. It's Talking Money with Jeff Tarbell. Talking Money. Talking Money. Entering the studio, your guru for fiscal fitness, Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. How you doing? Good morning. Coming to you live from the Financial Nerve Center of Granite Bay, California. That's right. Otherwise known as my garage. It's a nice garage. Yeah. Got a garage with a chair in it. <laughs> John and I doing a little uh, little pre-testing before we get on the road this, this year. And uh, thanks to Vince Mastraco, we're going to... Try out his much more um, reasonably sized and easy to use broadcast unit. So um, if it drops out on us here, we'll dial back up. But it seems to be, you know, stable so far. I guess Chris can. Uh, I guess Chris will be texting me if it doesn't work as, as it should be. How you doing? I'm doing good. This works out nice, huh? This is cozy. We could actually put this on the back of a small motorcycle and go somewhere. Oh, that's right. That's if, right. Or we could just not do the show and go somewhere anyway. We thought they were going to do that today up at Sierra, but. Uh... Yeah, as I look the out, weather blew in. look out the weather. I just didn't, uh, you know, we were supposed to do do a little live at Sierra Tahoe. I think we've got it scheduled for next Saturday still. But honestly, I just didn't want to. I thought it would be, you know, worse than this now, and I didn't want to beat it, beat it through the snow there for uh, for an hour show. So hopefully next week it'll be a little better. But if you're skiing, this is the time to go. They That's actually right. have some snow. Hey, we start every show the same way though. So if Chris Verlot has uh, got his headset on down there, we'll check in with that guy. What's happening with you, Chris, today? Not much. I love the show. I don't have to look at you guys. Yeah, well, we do too. Let me get, let me guess what shirt you're wearing. It's something that's soccer related. Hey, very good. <laughs> that Etihad thing on it. Yeah, Etihad. Right. What's happening in your world there? Uh, well, I think you both know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I have no idea what's going to come out of your mouth at any time. The uh, Sacramento Republic. Their season starts tonight. First game ever uh, down in Los Angeles. So it's one of those games I wish I could be at, but I've got to do the Kings game here. So I'm here. I'll be watching it somewhere, but. Uh, they just started selling tickets to the public, and how awesome would it be if there was 20,000 people at Hughes Stadium for the first game and uh, show why Sacramento deserves an MLS team? When is that first game, Chris? First game is April 26th. Okay, so we got a little, little bit of time there. And do we, do, we have a, do we have an ETA on when they're supposed to have the, the deal at Cal Expo together? As of right now, what I've heard is the first three games are at Hughes Stadium, so basically like the month of May. Okay, well, that'll be cool. That'll be quick. Yeah, we'll have to get we'll have to get back in touch with Warren Smith. Maybe we'll we'll get out there that one of those first first weekends and uh, do a little show from the from somewhere out there. All right, Chris, thank you very much. And Chris will be man on the phones for us today, so we do have some uh, Rivercats baseball tickets to give away, and a little bit of round table pizza, all out of the Sierra Tahoe passes. But if you've got some, they're open through what they say the, the week know? after Easter, so through what? April. I have my calendar in front of me, so at least al- almost another month, huh? That's right. Yeah, so get out. They probably, probably have the best snow of the year in the next couple of weeks than they have all year. So check them out at Sierra Tahoe if you'd like to do that, too. Yeah, open through the 27th at this point. Our number's in the studio if you want to jump in today, 339-1140, 1-800-920-1140. And you can text us at 44-1140. And I do have the text machine working here at my house, so I can sh- check out those as well. So we will uh, get all those things going. Interesting. Um, God, i got all kinds of... I, I, I probably, if I literally, if I fall asleep halfway through the show, well, that would be normal anyway. But I woke up like at 3:15 this morning, could not get back to sleep, and no, I wasn't drinking beforehand, or maybe I should have been. I just, I don't know what it was. It was going through my head. But um, I woke up, you know, sometime around 5 o'clock in the morning. I started on some sort of rant in my head about what, what the hell we're doing with our current, our current uh, political. I don't want to call them appointees, but they, they, somehow they got they somehow they got uh, elected, and I'm, I, I think it's all the news this week between. But well, we had I think three state of California officials get released or asked to leave the Senate. Not 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 too not too not too soon either. 
Uh, although none of them have been convicted of anything, they've certainly been accused of some things, and so we'll see how that shakes out. But um, you know, as I was driving home, driving home last night, listening to the celebration that we have now had six million people log into the Affordable Care Act website, either local, state ones, or na- nationwide, and create. Basically, they, so we had six million people create an account. Doesn't mean six million people have paid. It means they, they, some, six million people have, you know, have acquired. And, and so let's. So I said, okay, let's assume they all paid. They haven't, but let's assume they have, because there's probably some stragglers that will. And then I heard that the original budget for this proposal was nine hundred million dollars. That was the the plan during the election season. The latest estimate is that the cost of of this one program. 2.7 trillion with a T trillion dollars. It was 900 billion. 900 start. billion, right. yeah. So th- basically, a 300% increase is what they estimate this program will cost. And they started listing off some of the some of the costs and some of the things that money they were spending, just the money for advertising. And that's the one that gets me the most. It's like if this if this is a program that is so incredibly beneficial, I mean, like we have to have it. And it's going to save us money. And why in the hell would we have to advertise? We should just open the door. I mean, it would be like interest rates going to 1.5%. I wouldn't even have to say anything. I just have to get my butt on the phone and answer it. But we're spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars advertising. So I did the math on it. And, and I'm out of fingers when I get past 10. And John wasn't here, so I couldn't even go to 20. 2.7 trillion, that's 13 zeros. John and I looked it up, right? Is that right? Was 12, no, 12. 12 zeros, yeah. 13 digits with the two in there. 12 zeros, and there's 6 million signups. So you drop all the zeros out, and, and my math says that that program will end up costing us, the U.S. taxpayers, $450,000 per individual who signed up for that program. That's one heck of an insurance policy. I would rather have just given each one of those individuals 100 grand and said, here, go to Kaiser and get a program. Don't get sick. Yeah, or, or I mean, and that's... Um, that doesn't account for the fact that people that lost their insurance. We're not talking about six million people new or net new. We're just talking about six million on that program. Now you can say you're a Republican and you're against it. You can say you already have health care you don't understand. And I'm just looking at it from a strict dollar amount. And I'm looking at the um, the celebration that goes from people who don't know squat about running a business, how they're celebrating a Six million dollar signups for 4.5, excuse me, 450 thousand dollars a person. I mean, some of the website costs to design were hundreds of millions of dollars to design a website that looks like you could go to GoDaddy and get the thing working for 29 bucks. It was redone a few times, I believe. <laughs> it's just it's one of those things that just you just look at it and you go, I mean, are you kidding me? We we consider this successful? I, I just I don't I just don't get it. I don't get it. That was one that was eating on me this morning a little bit too. I did see. Um, I'll get into the mortgage stuff in a minute. See, so I, I, I did see. Speaking of uh, absolute going the wrong direction, um, this is another one that I, I couldn't. I just couldn't wrap my hands around. And this is the Candy Crush IPO. Now I am not a a, game, a gamer, so I don't. I can't sit here and tell you what Candy Crush is, other than I know it's a game and it's probably an iPhone. It's probably a phone app game. Have you? Play candy? I have no idea what it is. Okay. So, so Other than it's been on the news headline. So, so we're too old for this for this article probably, but uh, Candy Crush was uh, expected to come out. Where is my uh, original original note here? Let's see. What did they originally price it at? The twenty two dollar and fifty cent IPO price was midpoint between its projected twenty one and twenty five dollar range. So they're going to come out at twenty two dollars and fifty cents a share. Um. Would have raised them 7.1 billion dollars for a game that produces. I mean, a company that produces games, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's nothing. If it produces income, that's what companies do. I don't care whether you make widgets or you make candy, candy crush games, or you do Facebook or you what. It doesn't matter as long as it makes money. But this in the first day, talk about a um, a downer first day. The single worst. IPO of the year, they lost a billion dollars in the first day, 
And looking at this morning's paper, they're now down 20% from its debut. So Candy Crush was crushed on its day on day one. Now you can, now I I would look at it if I were one of the stockholders in Candy Crush, particularly if I was in early. And I wouldn't say, boy, we started at seven, I ended up at six billion. I would just say, we got six billion we got bucks. Six billion. So I would look at it probably depending on where you come in. Now if you came in and you bought shares at twenty one fifty or twenty two fifty, and they dropped twenty percent, and you're down in the eighteen dollar range right now, maybe not so happy. But you don't have to sell either. It's a gaming app. Yeah, I, I, I got it. I got it. So um, they're starting to compare Candy Crush to Zynga. Let's see here. Zynga has revenue of $873 million and net loss of $37 million. Hmm. Can, uh, King, Candy, well, the King, I think it's called uh, King Digital. There you go. They um, had $1.9 billion in sales, almost twice of, of Zynga, and profits of $568 million. So let's think about that for a minute. So you're going to take, um, so basically they're trading at about 10 times their profit. Because if you take 568 million times 10, that's 5, yeah, that's 5 billion. So about, they're about trading at about a, a ratio of about 10 to 1, which is not out of line, hmm. as long as you think it'll keep making sales. And that's the hard part. I think that's what's starting to worry people a little bit is like, okay, what are they going to do next? You know, so they're looking at other things anyway. But anyway, it was kind of an interesting week. They came out and, um, King Mobile games were installed in more than 65 million times in February, but down from 76 million in December. Um, so that's a lot of <laughs> that's a lot of downloads. And I bet they didn't spend as much for their website as the Obamacare did, but that's a different story. But anyway, King or Candy Crush, maybe a good time to go out and buy now if you believe in them because they went they're down 20 percent in the first couple of days. Seventy some million downloads in a month. Yeah, yeah, 65 wow. million in February and 76 million in December. To think I go to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not you're not you're, you're got the wrong crush going on there Apparently. with the with the, uh, the candy crush thing. So it was an interesting interesting week. Speaking of other IPOs, we talked about this in the past, and I I kind of kind of dropped off the uh, the face of the earth a little bit, and then here it comes back up again. But um, Fantex is now up and running, and investors can buy stocks in their players and their earning potential. We talked about this before. You can buy in a player. Right. Vernon Davis of your San Francisco 49ers has now signed up. And uh, the, the deal requires Fantex to pay Davis four four million dollars in exchange for ten percent of his future earnings. Now you talk about a speculative stock. A, a, a Vernon Davis is not a running back. He's a he's a I guess. A, is he, is he, hey Chris, is Vernon Davis tight a end. wide receiver? He's tight end. Okay, so wide receiver, tight end. So you are one knee job away from not getting your money back. So you've got to make. Vernon Davis has got to make forty million dollars because you're going to get ten percent of it just to get your money back, and then you got to get a return on it. So this is almost like one of those Candy Crush things. It's almost, it's almost like you're. All, I think you just want to say I own part of Vernon Davis's. You know, I'm a partner with Vernon Davis. I don't. I don't. This I don't get. I don't get. And, and maybe like a Tom Brady or somebody who's got all this other income on the side. Um, Peyton Manning, you know, Jordan, LeBron, those. But then you'd have to pay, you know, right. in excess. Twenty times that. Yeah, you'd have to pay in excess. I, 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 this I don't get. I'm curious. Any of you out there? We'll we'll throw that out as a text question. Text, and we'll pick one of the uh, respondents today if I get my text line working here. Would you? You can text us at 441140. Would you spend some of your hard-earned money to own a part of a? It doesn't have to necessarily be an athlete. It could be a. a I guess you could do a Shakira, or you could do anybody you wanted to, who have a portion of their income. But the athlete seems to be the most. Risky. I mean, just I mean, the in the NFL, the percentage of of injuries has got to be almost 100 percent. It's whether you recover or not. So, would you be willing to uh, invest some money in your favorite athlete for a return of 10 percent of their future earnings? I don't know. I, I I my answer would be probably for me no. Maybe go with the quarterbacks if they can last. I I don't I don't know. I mean, I, for me, you'd have to pick somebody that has that has so much potential off. The field, and it doesn't matter whether it's baseball or whatever, that they can make money no matter what. And you look at Jordan; he hasn't played in forever, and he's you know he's still doing underwear commercials. So we'll throw that out there as, as our text question of the day: forty-four, eleven, forty. Would you a Would you do that? And b Who would you invest in? Who's your pick? Where you say, okay, yeah, I, I'd put in, I'd put in that kind of money and, and take for ten percent of the return. Who would you do that with if they'd be willing to do that? Well, I'm pretty sure Jeff, you'd probably do it for Oprah, right? 
I would take um, a half a percent of anything. Oprah, anything she touches is like gold. What'd she do this week? She made you some did money. See, she bought uh, sixty acres and tell you ride. She no, no. we're gonna yeah. be neighbors. Sixty Actually. acres and tell you ride. <laughs> so you can. Uh, I think she's back on your list of. Well, there's no question. If, if Oprah comes, it ends up in, on this street in Granite Bay and says she wants to get married, I'm in. I mean, I, my wife said it's fine. Go for it. I, oh, you said tell you ride. I thought you said real Linda. I'm I tell you ride. Oh, okay, gotcha. So Oprah's got a little a little project up there. Okay. We got a um, let's throw out a quiz question here a little bit. I'm gonna come back and get a little some mortgage related stuff today as, as well. Three three nine eleven forty is our number here in the studio. One eight hundred nine two zero eleven forty, or you can text us at forty four eleven forty. Our ongoing text question of the day right now is, would you invest in a company like Fantex where you can basically own ten percent of the future earnings of a sports star or and we'll throw out there a celebrity? And if you would do that, who would you uh, want to invest in? And we'll t- we'll pick uh, somebody off the text line there at 441140 and give them some round table pizza today. But we also got some uh, River Cats baseball. And uh, what do you got for on the quiz question there? So let's talk Twitter. Oh yeah. Another thing we're a little bit out of our league on, but uh, Twitter. No, I got a bunch of tweets this week. Did? Uh-huh. Good. Right. Well, two, three. <laughs> I can't talk about it, but I got a bunch. Okay, so uh, first quiz question of the day for River Cats tickets yep. or some artesian flatbread pizzas uh-huh. is whom is has the most followers on Twitter? Who is number one with followers on Twitter? And I, I know the answer now. I would never, right, ever have got it, and, and we won't. Eh. People might know, so we'll, and I put it out on my on my talking money Facebook page last night too. So we'll see if we did a little, little homework in advance. If not, we'll give it we'll give a, uh, a clue after the break. But I'm going to tell you, it's not the Pope who has 12.2 million followers. Wow, good for him. Yeah, he's got one big follower and a bunch of little he's followers. Got a lot of followers. So 12 million is so it's more than how many? Well, can you give us the number? How many followers is it? 51 million followers. Holy cow! That's like a one person has 51 million. That's like million a sixth of the country. Wow. That's a lot. Okay, 51 million followers. Who or what? It could be an animal, right? Soupy. <laughs> who's got 51 million followers on Twitter? 339-1140, 1-800-920-1140, or you can text us at 441140. That's John. I'm Jeff. This is Talk of Money coming to you live from the Granite Bay area of South Placer County. This is Talk of Money, and we're going to be right back, Jack. Money. Well, all righty then. We're back to talking money with Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. How you doing? We are uh, live on the road. Actually, we're not on the road. We're in my garage. It's kind of in, the, the in, my, in my mom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> Got to start somewhere. <laughs> we have just degraded this show right down to the ground here. We are uh, running a little test today on some mobile equipment that we are borrowing. Thanks to uh, Mr. Ms. Mastraco has let us borrow his much handier football size unit as opposed to the one I have that needs a small semi truck to get around. So we're uh, running a test before we get out and find out we don't know how, what we're doing. We already know what we don't know what we're doing, but we at least we'll have the equipment working when we don't know what we're doing. So I had, I had a um, quiz question hanging out there. And, it, and by the way, if you text me, and one of you did get the text uh, question right, you need to give us either your full phone number or your name and address so we can mail you Rivercats baseball tickets if you want them. So the person from the 916-320, they need to text back and give us their name and address or their full phone number so we can call you. And um, the question, we were talking about Twitter and um, the number of followers that somebody has, the number one follower. And you were saying, I got a lot of Justin Bieber's, I got a lot of Shakira's. You said that Lady Gaga was number one for the longest time? For two years. Wow. So what happened? Two-year following, she was uh, number one, and then Justin Bieber surpassed her. Mm Mm-hmm. Actually, Lady Gaga's followers have names. They're the little monsters. Okay. And then you have Bieber, who are the believers. Okay. And then you have our winner, which is the top, Katy Perry, which are the Katy Cats, with 51 million followers currently. Jeez. That's a lot of people. I mean, I don't care what you're doing. That's a lot of people. Of course, that's worldwide. Well, that, I was saying a break. So you have 72 million people downloading Candy Crush. Yeah. Justin Bieber picked up 9,900 yesterday followers just yesterday yeah 
What is wrong with us? <laughs> we got we don't we can't figure out why our economy won't get to start back up. We're too busy downloading candy games and twitty, tweeting uh, singers. So. so we're willing to pay a half a million dollars almost for Obamacare each That's, person. Yeah. Well, we're not willing, but we are going to have to. Did you? Uh, did they give anybody else on that list? You said the Pope had twelve million. Did you get anybody else off that? I'm trying to figure out who else was like. Yeah. Uh, so Katy Perry, Justin Bieber, then Barack Obama, Lady Gaga, and kind of goes down from there. But seven of the top ten are singers in the music business. In the music yeah. business. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so there you go. So if you had that right, uh, we'll get you out uh, your choice: some round table pizza or some. Rivercats baseball tickets, we can do that as well. Speaking, uh, I was on my rant this morning about just po- po- political waste, and I guess, I, I guess I can't even be, you know what? I can't even be mad at the politicians anymore, because you know, if you've heard that, you, you, you screw me once, you know, shame on you. You screw me twice, shame on me. And screw me seven point billion times, and I guess I deserve it. But uh, we have come to a, a point in time where I, I just think. If you're a politician, I don't believe that any politician starts out to be a dirtbag. I mean, I mean, maybe there are a few, but I don't, I don't. I just honestly don't believe you go into that thinking, I'm just going to, you know, try to screw over the public or do things. I, I just think that you, you end up there, and I don't know why it is. It's, it's, it's so disappointing because I really, at the, at the heart of it, if you ask me what I would, what I would like to do when I was done with the mortgage business a little bit, I'd like to do something at the state, le- at the state level, not at the federal level. I don't give a damn about going to Washington, but but I was born and raised here in Northern California. I love California. I want to see it get better. I don't think I could do it. I mean, honest to God, I, in all honesty, A, I, couldn't, I don't think I could be elected because I would tell you what comes out of my mouth would be the truth and you wouldn't want to hear it because nobody wants to hear the truth because that ain't fun and that isn't, you know, that's, we need a lot of work to do. I'd probably never get elected, and if I did get elected, I probably would shoot myself in the head when I was down there because of all the crap that they have to deal with, and I... And I but if you got a handful or two of people that were all saying how it was, which I don't is, is very tough to do. I don't know. Maybe it's a special interest thing. Maybe that you people are just they get. You're so busy trying to get reelected that you 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 for lack of a better terms, you just kind of you know you become a slave to to the money to what I I, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know what the answer is. If we don't figure it out, then we're we're going to have to figure it out the hard way. We're going to come to a, you know, a collapse until we figure it out. It's, it's frustrating. Uh, this is, I've been carrying this article for weeks because I didn't know where to fit it in, but this, it kind of goes in the same category. So um, it's been 25 years now. In fact, this was last month, I think, was the 25th year anniversary of this sign. Have you ever seen this sign anywhere? Warning, this area contains a chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer. Have you ever seen that? Everywhere yes. you've been? A, everything causes cancer. <laughs> B, um, locking yourself in your room and avoiding everything probably causes cancer. So Proposition 65, the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986, requires the state government to publish a list of chemicals known to cause cancer or reproductive harm and businesses to post such warnings. Twenty-five years later, there is not a single empirical study that demonstrates any public health benefit to this program, which means there's been no reduction in the percentage of cancer, there's been nothing to show that this thing, this program works. How much money has been billed to businesses? And I'm not even talking about the cost of producing the sign. I'm talking about fines. Maybe want to take a guess? In an 11-year window between 2000 and 2011, there were 2,381 settlements costing one, just under $179 million, exclusive of legal costs and settlements uh, on this act. So we've 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 burdened business in California for 179 million dollars in a 10-year window. This is a 25-year-old law to put up signs that say we may warn you of something that that may or may not be in here. By the way, there's 860 chemicals on the list. Water is probably on the list if we could find any, and um, it has to have a, a, at least an exposure of one to 100,000 chance of getting exposed to it to put the sign up. One to 100,000. Right. So we have. Um, I think you need to put one in here. And they're trying now to track, track down on some of the bounty hunter lawsuits that are that are coming up. Um, uh, last year, Governor Brown signed a, a law that gives businesses a two-week grace period and a smaller $500 fine per facility. But there you go, $179 million in the state in, t- in a 10-year window, and we have done nothing to resolve that issue. That's the kind of stuff that would probably drive me nuts. I'm just, you know, just throwing it out there. 
I also saw this week that um, Congress is going to get back in the business of fixing the mortgages. Fantastic. An interesting opinion article out of the local paper. Uh, people at the top of the mortgage fraud pyramid are unscathed, and it was lamenting that um, la- in, last, in 2012 there was only 170, 107 people um, that were arrested or indicted on mortgage fraud in, in 2012. And uh, I would maybe go to disagree a little bit that there's been a whole bunch of people that have been unscathed or have been scathed either financially or most of them, a lot of the ones that were committing the fraud have been run out of business. Some are in jail. And um, I use, so John and I, I started a few years ago, John's been helping, we, we teach a, a mortgage and credit class at high schools. I've probably done it now for about five years. And I usually start every class the same way when it comes to this topic. I don't use this analogy, but I, I'm going to start using it. Are you familiar with the, the, the analogy of the butterfly in the Caribbean? Have you ever heard that? No. So you, 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 it's, it's a, it's a, it's an analogy. It's a joke, but it's, it's kind of how did, how does a hurricane start and land on, you know, end up in the United States? You track it all the way back, all the way back, all the way back, and you get back into the Caribbean on a beautifully calm day, and a butterfly leaps off of a flower and does a little 360 pattern, looking for another place to land, and it lands back down. And a little, yeah, a little wave of air comes off the butterfly. The butterfly had no bad intentions. And the air, you know, moves a little bit, and then a month later it's picking up, and then you know, and six six weeks later it, it's Hurricane Katrina and hits the ground. Obviously, that's not how it happens, but it's a an analogy of of unintended consequences and a little butterfly doing its own thing, and and we end up with a hurricane from it. Um, that is the analogy that I use for the mortgage the mortgage meltdown. And I go back to who's the butterfly? Well, for me and my story, the way I teach it in my world. The butterfly in that story is Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters is a representative in Congress. And in some time, I have to go back. And I need to find, I'm sure there's a YouTube clip of it. I need to find it. It's either 05 or 06. It may be me earlier than that. She got up in front of the mortgage business, particularly the big banks, and said, you guys are discriminating against all of us. You're, you're keeping people from buying homes. You're not letting people of color buy. You're not letting people of lesser income buy homes. You know All these things that you're not doing. So you will do them or we will run your butt out of business and this is a uh, my my version of of the story but it, it's out there you can find it and i and i don't think that and i go back to i don't think that the reason i use her as the butterfly is i don't think that she had malintention i think she wanted to see her constituency get into homes particularly at the time because home homes were going up in value and people were making good appreciation on them but what happened we had a hurricane from that butterfly Lenders took that as a, as a clue that we better start making more loans. Even if we can't figure out a way to justify making loans, we're going to make loans. And we're going to put people into home loans. They have no business being in home loans. And what trickled down to was probably the second biggest financial collapse next to the Great Depression in this country from you know the, the housing meltdown. And so whenever I look at these articles that say people at the top of the mortgage pyramid were unscathed, and they're not being per- prosecuted and persecuted enough by our politicians, I think some of them know that they were in part the cause to what was going on back in 05 and 06. I mean, they, they literally lit the fuse and then ran away. And now here this group is back, and they're going to fix the issue. And one of the proposals on the table is to get rid of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were two of the biggest... Um, causes or um, igniters or you know whatever you want to call it the the the, the powder in the keg of uh, of making the mortgage business explode and here we are now at on the back side of this problem the issue for the most part has been fixed in fact i would say no i mean you're, it's not entirely you're never going to fix having some bad mortgages but they're back within the percentages that they were before the industry has never been tougher to get in to stay in more expensive to stay in compliance. Those two entities by themselves are making billions of dollars. They're actually making a profit for the for the government right now. And now we're going to fix it. <laughs> the people that don't know anything about anything in terms of the mortgage business are going to fix an issue that they were in, in, in part responsible for causing. And that bothers me a little bit. And I don't know what it's going to lead to, but I do know this: if you don't have a steady supply and a steady way for people to, companies like ours, to to, unlo- uh, to deliver their mortgages, to, to get their product, get their money back. 
and move on and make more loans. And you don't have a stable way of doing that, then you'll have less money available. Have you ever heard that? Ever seen that supply and demand chart? What happens? You know, less funds available. Price goes up. Rates go up. Yeah, less fun, less funds available. Rates go up, and less places to sell them. So you start then you start saying, okay, I only have these five dollars, you know, to make loans. So, so if I'm only going to make these five dollars alone, who am I going to make these five dollars loans to? Well, let me see here. There's four individuals with 800 plus credit scores, and there's four over here with 640s. So you know, these guys have 20% down. These people don't. I mean, you know, you're, you're going to start winding down potentially a source of good buyers. And you could have a great buyer that doesn't have necessarily a perfect credit score. You can have a slack ass that doesn't, you know, that has great credit who loses his job shortly. I mean, so you know, there's a you want a, you want a mix of both, you know, in my eye, in my eyes. So anyway, it's going to be interesting to see what shakes out over the next few weeks and how some of that comes together. But I'm I'm convinced of one thing, that there's a big election in, is it 16? Is that the next president? Yeah. So there's a big election in uh, 18 months, 20 months. Probably not going to do anything to screw up the economy. I don't care which side of the alley you're on. If you're, if you're a Republican, you think you're going to win something. If you're a Democrat, you think you're going to win something. Let's not do anything, which is their general motto, right? Let's not That's do anything. That's right. Let's not do anything to mess up the, mess up the market in the next uh, before the next election. But it will be um, fascinating to follow along and see, you know, what happens there, what happens to Fannie and Freddie. Maybe they'll combine them together. They'll be kind of one new entity, which would be fine. I mean, I mean, if they're so they're, they're sisters. I mean, they're so similar to each other. And we probably don't need to. Uh, and maybe there maybe there's some maybe there is some some logic there there's something you say okay we, we're not going to you know we're going to keep the good parts of that but we're going to reduce the risk i think that you, you do see that the government looking and saying okay we don't want that to happen again and i agree okay we are we got stung bad. let's look backwards and say what what did we do well and what didn't we do well so if we can eliminate some of the risk to the u.s taxpayer awesome but if we also eliminate the ease to funds for for borrowers at reasonable rates not so awesome so keep still your, a product makes difference slightly with Fannie and Freddie too. Yeah, there is. And and that might be good for the por- portfolio just to have that separation. Yeah, I, I, well, I think what they want to do is, and, and, and it will happen, but they, they want more private people to come in. You know, they want more banks to come in and more private investors to come in and, and take up the market. But when rates are only, you know, three-something percent on a 15-year fixed and four-something percent on a 30-year fixed, is there a lot of demand to come in and, and take a lot of that risk? Yeah. No. I mean, I mean, I know you're not. I know you're earning zero somewhere else, but dang, that's that's still pretty low. Now, yeah, for the long term. Yeah. Now, when rates get to be, you know, five something for a 15-year fixed and six something for a 30-year fixed, you'll you'll see a lot more. I think you'll see a lot more people come in the market and say, hey, at those rates, we got some we got some interest. And so we're you know, there's a great article here about the downside of the Fed of the Fed getting so involved with interest rate manipulation. They're putting so much money into the system that a bank is sitting here. Talking money. And we're back to talking money. And here's Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. How you doing? I guess we dropped out there. This is why we're running the test because that's twice now. And it's, it's, so it seems to be dropping out about it right about the half hour mark. And I don't know whether that's just timing out or what. But uh, right during my very best segment, best ever, it was off the air. Hey, we do have a quiz question for you if you want to jump in today, too. 339-1140, 1-800-920-1140. You can text us at 44-1140. The text line is working. And, yes, we um, remember if you text me either give me your name and address or give me your full phone number and we can uh, get you out some round table pizza if you prefer that or um river cats baseball river, tickets. river cats yeah, and if you get those river cats baseball tickets they're good for any game you want it's it's so cool you just walk up to the up to the um window there and they'll give you whatever the best seats available are so you don't need to have a specific date you go when you want to go and i think I say they should start up here probably in the next couple of weeks. So uh, for reals, so we'll get reals. get out there and, and get it. We got to well, we'll have to get we'll have to work with Warren on some soccer tickets. I'm sure we can work that out too. Get a little Republic soccer going. So we do have a quiz question for you during the uh, 
as we return here. Sorry about that for dropping out on you a little bit. This is why we're doing our test here today. It's easier for us to, to manage here. Go ahead, Johnny. That's right. So we've been talking about the big banks. We've been talking about Fannie and Freddie Mac. And uh, the question here is, this is regarding Bank of America, but Bank of America uh, is paying out, let's see, to Fannie and Freddie this year, $9.3 billion to settle claims. Okay. The quiz question is, what? How much money did Bank of America spend in 2013 for legal and litigation fees? How much did Bank of America spend for legal and litigation fees in the year 2013? So not any fees or penalties. Just That's right. Just hey, all I know is that I'm in the wrong, wrong business because you go back to I don't know what how far back it goes, but there's a three or four years on that sheet. It was back to 2010. Yeah, there's a boatload of money in there i mean i, I mean I, you got to think that they must they must just have people on staff now it's it is that is the you know out of all the things from the mortgage the mortgage meltdown they came out of it in my opinion the worst right um they really they were bank america was you know a shining example of a very phenomenal company in this country forever i mean just forever and where they are now, in my opinion, compared to where they were, is 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 just, they're just. I mean, people can't. I you hear all the time from people. You know, do, do, if you're doing a business there, you know, please, if you guys sell your loans, don't sell them to B of A, or right. get me out of there. Right. You look at people who had to go through the foreclosure process, and and the, the number one complaint is you know, B of A was was terrible. Of course, you know, percentage wise, they probably had more than than most. Um, I, I I feel I honestly. Uh, I feel very bad for for them for the way they ended up. I think the whole, I think it all started when they were forced, and I think they were forced to take over Countrywide. I, agree. I don't know why they were for, forced to do that. I don't know who made that decision or why it was thrust upon them. I don't get it, but they took over the devil in the mortgage in the mortgage world. What was what was included in that deal cost them? I, I, I you know you got to be I mean hundreds. Of billions of dollars, I would imagine, just in fines, penalties, legal fees, you name it, and it it just really ruined an otherwise great reputation. It's sad. Yeah, and, and so much of their legal battle. I mean, the headline here: Bank of America's game of legal whack-a-mole isn't over yet. But fortunately for investors, there are fewer of the critters to worry about. So all the litigation and challenges they had, they're just constantly out there fighting this battle. And uh, you know, it, apparently they're getting somewhere. Well, yeah, because they'll never be over though. It was 9.5 billion dollar. I mean, how much money did you do you have to make just to you know just to cover your you know we're still connected just to cover your fees and things? I, I mean, I just it's just so sad. And, and I, I'm not a B of A shareholder. I, I don't care. It's, but you you read these articles here. You know, people at the top of the pyramid scheme were unscathed. It's not true. I mean, that 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 company was decimated by by that incident. And I think unfairly. I mean, quite frankly, B of A didn't make a lot of the bad loans early on. They ended up acquiring, you know, a cancer. It's just, it's just, it's horrendous. So, the question was, how much did B of A spend last year in legal fees alone? And I'll tell you, it was in the billions. Um, if if you want to take a guess here at three three nine eleven forty, or you can text us at forty four eleven forty, and we'll uh, we'll give you some round, or not, yeah, round table or some uh, baseball. In 2010, 11, 12, and 13, each of those years was over 2 billion. So it's just it's just a phenomenal number. I don't I don't know where we, you know, where we dropped out. <laughs> Someone guessed 103 billion. No, if it was 103 billion, John and I would actually be getting we'd be in law school right now, <laughs> because we actually have some mortgage experience. We'd be I'd be taking classes. I'd be taking my uh, my bar exam right now. No, it wasn't. I, I bet you though that that's a a very close number. Uh, this was a guess on the online 103 billion. I bet you it's a very close number when it, when they start from the beginning to end. When they finally say, "Okay, we're done with this issue." Total monies. I bet you it'll be very close to that. Very close to that. But that was not a one-year payout. Uh, I don't know. If, I know we dropped off a little bit there early last break, but I was just just kind of summarizing where some of the good news. So everybody's panics when they say the Fed's going to taper off. They're going to quit buying bonds. They're going to quit pumping money into the system. And what that means is, I was using the, the analogy of, of the uh, John Fotorero Bank, and John, 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 John's bank has X numbers of dollars to lend. And the way it's been going on right now is that the federal government will come and say, "Hey, we need money. We need some short-term borrowing money." 
So John looks to the left and says, well, the Fed will pay me not a very high rate, but it's risk-free. Or Jeff's company comes up and says, hey, we're, you know, we're starting a new venture. We want to borrow some money from you, too. We'll pay you more. And the bank's got to make a decision. They're like, okay, do we take the quick, easy money over here, or do we want to deal with, with this dumbass and his, his business concept? So they make the money the loan to the Fed. And that money gets sucked out of the system. And so guys that are trying to start a business or grow their business are looking around going, I, I can't find any money. Well, the biggest benefit coming back now from this program of lessening the federal borrowing is that now John's bank looks around every day and says, hey, guys, you know, we got uh, $5 million sitting here that we're paying some depositor almost nothing on it, but we, we, we make money making loans. You better call Jeff and his company back up or these other guys and get them back in here. We need to start making some loans. And this is already, you know, even though the Fed's just kind of started winding things down, it's, they're already noticing the bank lending, like in, just from January to February alone, rose at a 21% annual rate. So, boom. I mean, there's a lot of businesses. And that's how we're going to get back, back to track. normal. Right. Not the federal government falsifying fake borrowing and, you know, and holding rates down. That isn't going to work. We've got to get real businesses borrowing real money, hiring real people, and, you know, and, and going forward. I don't know if you, uh, some of you may, I don't know if I even posted anywhere this week. I was talking to a buddy of mine who's uh, in the manufactured home business, a guy named Farrell up in, up in uh, Nevada County. And he and I did a bunch of business for years. And I used to, used to build these things brand new and sell them. It was, it was, it was great. It was a nice, affordable product for people. I bet he hasn't sold. I'm, I'm guessing this is a wag, a wild ass guess. I bet he hasn't sold five houses in three years. I, I'm sure, maybe, you know, yeah. I mean, he's sell, you know, he's selling dirt to, you know, sand in the Sahara. He, he, there ain't nobody was buying manufactured, new manufactured homes and putting on. Talked to him the other day because I had a couple pieces of property up in the uh, in the foothills that someone was asking about. And, hey, would you put me, you know, put a house on a piece of property for me that you own? And I called him up and just said, Hey, how are things, how are things going? He said, Dude, we are eight weeks back backlogged in construction. And he says, I haven't seen this kind of volume since 2006. Now, maybe because they only hire, they have the same four guys swinging a hammer. They might need some more staff. But I look around, and you know, my brother-in-law, who's in the grading and paving business, and you know, those kind of things, and, and they're swamped. swamped. So things are getting, you know, better. And hopefully we'll continue to grow. Hopefully you're feeling that out there, and your company is, you know, is doing better. And we'll see some more normal, less government-involved business it would be phenomenal. That's the that's the goal at least. Yeah, huh? Got to get into the private. Yeah, Chris, did you get a winner on that on that question for B of A? Well, the answer what what was how much did they spend, John? Six billion dollars. So think about that. One company spent six billion dollars, basically fighting one issue, a past mortgage-related issue. For the most part, six billion dollars. That is money that is just wasted defending or resolving, you know, past transactions. It's ridiculous. It's about 18 billion over the last four years. Yeah. I mean, what what an exorbitant amount of wasted money. It's it's just sad. And and that's just one company. I bet you could go to Wells. Everybody else too. I'm sure, I'm sure the numbers are staggering. We're in the wrong business. We should have been <laughs> young attorneys. Anyway, that music means we got to wrap it up. Our, uh, during the week, you can find us on, we have a Talk of Money Facebook page. We post this show and other shows there every week. Kind of give you some hints to some of the upcoming quiz, quiz, quiz questions. You can find, uh, John, what's your website there? John at johnfod.com or j-o-h-n-f-o-d.com. You can find John there during the week. So if you have some financing interest, you want to look into a home loan or some things like that, you can find John at johnfod.com or jefftarbell.com. That means uh, we got to wrap it up. I think we might be live at Sierra Tahoe next weekend. We'll see how the weather goes. Until then, have a great weekend, everybody. Be safe. Drive care.